Hi everyone and welcome to this Godot tutorial on how to create a simple 2D character controller. By the end of this video, you'll know how to set up a basic physics-based 2D player movement manager with some collisions with the ground and even a little walk animation. Also, note that for this tutorial, I'll be using this little 2D level based on tile maps. And if you're curious about how to create such a scene, you can check out this previous tutorial to learn the basics of 2D tile maps in Godot. And as usual, don't forget that if you want to get the files of the tutorial directly, you can have a look at the GitHub repo with all my Godot tutorials over here. And with that said, let's dive in and discover the fundamentals of making a 2D character controller in Godot and C Sharp. Okay, to begin with, let's discuss the different elements that we need in our player object. For this tutorial, I'll be using the sprites from the platformer art pack in Kenny's amazing library, and in particular, I'm gonna use one of his really cute alien characters for the player visuals. So here, our player object will need to do three things. First, it will need to actually show on screen. So we'll need to show some image, some sprite of our alien character to visualize the object. Second, it will need to collide with the ground and be subjected to gravity, overall use forces to move around. So we'll have to use a physics body and a collision shape, just like we saw earlier in this series with the Getting Started tutorial, except that this time we'll be using the 2D version of Godot Physics Nodes. And finally, it will need to react to our inputs to move horizontally or jump. So we'll need to code a bit of logic to tie these key presses to actual actions on screen. Note that here, we we'll explore how to code this logic in c because there are already other tutorials on the net on how to do it in GDScript, and coding c in Godot is not as widely discussed. So for this tutorial, you should make sure that you have a version of Godot with the .NET support enabled. But anyway, now that we know what structure we want, let's build our player hierarchy. You see that I've already imported the character sprites from Kenny's pack, and I have one sprite for the idle standing visual, plus a series of sprites for the walk animation. For now, let's just ignore the animation and use the basic standing sprite to visualize our player. Since we're going to work in 2D, let's start by creating a 2D root node in our scene, and then let's create a child node of type sprite2d. That's a basic 2D image renderer, and to set its image, we simply need to go to the texture field in its inspector, Use the drop-down and select one of the load options to reference our image file asset from the project. Also, let's rename the node idle sprite so that we remember that it just handles the single standing visual of the alien. Okay, now to have our object collide with the ground, we said that we need to do two things. First, we have to transform our root node into a 2D body so that it can compute forces and move the overall player object. And second, we have to give it a collider so it's blocked by the terrain. For the body node, Godot actually has a nice built-in for our case called Character Body 2D. As you can see in the little description at the bottom, it's specifically made to create characters moved by script, so that's exactly what we need here. For the collider, we'll add a new collision shape 2D node in our hierarchy and set its shape to a 2D capsule. Be sure to also adjust its size on the model so that it fits the visual. Otherwise, the gamers will feel like it's quite inconsistent. And a little extra trick, let's give our player a camera 2D node. Basically, by integrating the camera into our player's hierarchy, it will follow it perfectly at all times and keep our alien centered in the screen. Now that our player object is ready, let's just save it as a new code scene so that we can reuse it in other bigger scenes. Then I'll open the main scene that I prepared beforehand and that, for now, simply contains a 2D tile map for the level. This tile map already has all the collisions set, and as you can see, it's got some jump or fall spots to test our gravity and moves later on. If you want to get this base template scene, have a look at my GitHub and look for the scene marked as template. To wrap up this first section, let's simply drag our player object in the scene, somewhere in the middle, slightly above the ground. At this point, if we try to run our small game with this main scene, we see that the player is not moving. And that's because, contrary to a rigid body, a character body isn't subjected to gravity or physics forces by default. So to fix this, let's see how to code a bit of C-sharp to have our character move. 
All right, our player Hayaki is ready to bust a move and it's time to use some C-sharp scripting to handle the basic gravity-based fall, the horizontal walking, and the jumping. The first step is to create our script and add it to our object. The best way to do this is actually to make sure that we are in our player scene, then right-click on the character body to denote at the root of this scene and click on the Attach Script option. This shows us a pop-up to create a new script resource in the project with some options already preset for us. But we still need to do a few changes. First, at the very top, we need to switch from GDScript to c -sharp. Then beneath, we see that the pop-up autofilled the inherits field with our nodes type. That's nice because it means that the script will properly retrieve all the properties and methods of the node and understand that it's actually a character body to the node and not just a node or a node to d However, this also auto-sets the template for the script, which is great when you want to develop your game quickly, but here, for tutorial, it's better to start from a simpler script skeleton. So let's use the drop-down to pick the basic node template. Then just choose a path for the script file and click the Create button. This is Kudo's built-in code editor. And as you can see, we can toggle between our scene editor and this code editor just by clicking on the context buttons at the very top of the screen. So the advantage of having a built-in code editor is that we can do everything without having to change windows or software. But there's still the drawback that it's not actually a code editor that people are used to, and you might not have all your plugins and favorite shortcuts. I think overall it's pretty good as it is, though typically for the C-Sharp it's still lacking some really cool features such as autocomplete. But anyway, you see that Godot filled our script with some lib imports at the top and a C-Sharp class that inherits from character body 2D as expected and that contains a few base lifecycle functions according to the node template that we asked for. These ready and process functions are basic hooks that you have in any game engine and that describe some of the most important moments of the life cycle of your objects. The ready function is the start point of the scene. It's executed when the scene is first loaded, and thus the node with this script attached on it is first loaded. Typically, that's great for initializing stuff that you only need to do once at the beginning. The process function is used for the update loop. It's executed every frame, and it's usually how you run continuous logic that executes again and again while the scene is running. You see that it receives a double delta parameter, which corresponds to the amount of time elapsed from the last frame. However, depending on the machine, this delta time amount might not be regular and universal. Lower tier machines will run slower, and there could be some moments where a computer needs to compute more or is busy doing something else outside of your application. And then you get slightly irregular intervals between your process calls. That's often no big deal on common update operations. But there are a few cases, such as physics-based movement, where this can be really annoying. That's why there's another processing function for the update called physics process, that also receives a delta time parameter, but this time you're absolutely sure that it will run regularly, no matter the frame rate of the game. By default, it will run 60 times per second, but you can change this in your project settings in the physics section. So here, typically for a 2D character controller with physics-based movement, it's better to use this. Now to actually have a character fall cause of gravity and move with the input, we're going to need a few variables so that we know how much to move the character each frame to perform those movements. So let's go back at the top of our class before the ready function and define three variables. First, the move speed, which is a float that determines the speed of the character across the screen. Note that whenever you're working in 2D in Godot, all distances are expressed in pixels, so that's why this number is pretty huge. Second, the jam velocity, which is also a float and gives the upward velocity to apply to the controller when we press the jump key. And finally, the gravity value, now, we could go and write it down manually, but in order to keep all the objects in the scene consistent and in sync, it's better to directly access our project settings and get the default 2D gravity value from there. You see it's easy to get using the projectsettings.getSetting built-in function. 
Alright, now the idea is to use those variables in our physics process function to have the character move as time goes by, either automatically because of gravity or to react to one of our key inputs. We'll compute all of this in a new velocity to the vector and finally reassign it at the end of the function once it's been updated. For the gravity, of course, we want to compute and apply it only if the character is in the air. Otherwise, there's no need to move it. Luckily, that's actually pretty straightforward to do. Because we're using the character body to the node type, and our class knows that with the inheritance, we can directly use a nice built-in function of this type called isOnFloor. This function tells us if the physics collider of our object is currently grounded on another to the physics collider. So basically, if we are not on the floor, then we'll want to apply gravity. This is a downward force along the vertical y-axis with the magnitude defined by our gravity parameter from before, and that we need to multiply by our delta time amount to accumulate it over time. Also, you see something really important, which is that in 2D in Godot, the y-axis points down, so a downward vector is actually positive on the y-axis. Okay, great. So let's try this out. We'll try to play our game, and you see that still nothing's happening. So what's the problem? Well, the thing is that for now, our process function has cooked up a new velocity value for our controller, but it's never actually used. To really apply this new velocity value on the controller, we need to call one other built-in at the end of the function, move and slide. This function uses the current velocity of the character body 2D node and moves it according to this speed. And there we go. The character now properly falls on the ground when we start the game due to gravity. The next step is to use our keyboard to have the player move horizontally left and right and jump. In this tutorial, we'll keep things simple and we'll use direct key names to do this. However, remember that in a real game, you'd probably rather use input actions to be able to define multiple bindings, handle cross-platform, and make the whole thing easier to re-edit in the future. By the way, if you're curious about that and you want me to talk about setting up input in Godot, feel free to drop a comment down below. But anyway, here, let's take care of our horizontal movement first. We'll start by setting our new horizontal velocity to zero, and then we'll check keyboard keys directly. Basically, if we're pressing the left arrow key, then our velocity along the x-axis will be minus our move speed. And if we're pressing the right arrow key, it will be plus our move speed. If we run the game again, you see that we can now move left and right. Pretty cool. To finish up our movement system, we can add a few lines to handle jump. So if we're pressing the spacebar, we'll see that our vertical velocity along the y-axis is minus the jump velocity. Cause remember that the y-axis points downwards, so an upward velocity like a jump is negative. And that's it. Our character can now move, jump, and fall when there's no terrain. A last improvement we can do is make sure that our character's visuals update as we're moving. So it's time to use Kenny's alien walk sprites to create a little animation and make it so that the player sees the difference between idle and walking. Okay, so for now, our player always shows this simple idle sprite. That's great when we're not moving and even works when we're jumping or falling, but it feels really weird when we're walking, cause at the moment it's more like we're sliding on the ground. To fix this, we're going to set up a very basic system with two sprite nodes. The one that we already have for the idle state, and a new one for the walking state. Except that this second node will actually be an animated sprite 2D, cause that will make it super easy to use all of these alien sprites from Kenny's package and make a sprite animation from all of them. So let's rename the node walk sprite and go at the bottom of the screen in the sprite frames editor that Kado opened up for us to set up our animation. We simply need to select all of our frames in the file system dock and drag them to this zone to add them to the animation. To test what it looks like, we can hide our idle sprite from before 
and then click on the play icon in the sprite frames editor. You see that all sprites are indeed played one after the other, but the rate is a bit too slow. To fix this, we can change the FPS value in this input, and we can replay the animation to check that it looks better. The final step is to ensure that the idle sprite and the walk sprite nodes are properly toggled on and off when we start or stop moving. So let's go back to our C-Sharp script to take care of this. First off, at the top, I'm gonna add two new variables of type sprite2d and animated sprite2d for both nodes, and I'll assign them in the ready function. To get those references, you see that we just have to use the built-in getNode function. We pass it the type of node to find as a generic type, and then we give it the path as a string. This path is relative to the node that our script is attached to, and it contains the exact list of nodes to go through to get the one that we need, separated by slashes, just like a file path. With those new variables ready, let's now go to the end of our physics process function and call a new private method called update sprite renderer. We'll define it as a void beneath, and this is the function that will handle showing or hiding our sprite nodes, playing the walk animation when need be, and even flipping the sprite to properly match the current move direction. It will take the velocity along the x-axis as input parameter so that we can know how to update our sprites. We'll begin by checking whether we're currently walking or not, depending on our horizontal velocity, and then we'll use this boolean flag to make our idle sprite and walk sprite either visible or hidden. And finally, if we're walking, we'll do two extra things. First, we'll play our animated sprite to this animation, and second, we'll flip the sprite according to whether the horizontal velocity is positive or negative. And here we are! If we restart our game, you see that our little 2D alien character now walks around with its cool animation, it can jump when we press the spacebar, and it falls because of gravity if we get out of the terrain. So there you go, you now know how to set up a simple 2D character controller in Godot and c -sharp, and even how to play a simple animation to match the movement. I hope you liked this tutorial and that it helped you learn the basics of Godot's 2D body controls, if you did, feel free to like the video and subscribe to the channel to not miss the next ones. And of course, don't hesitate to drop a comment with ideas of the tricks that you'd like to learn. As always, thanks a lot for watching, and take care.